This is the first in a series of what we're calling congressional exit interviews. Uh, at the R Street Institute, um, which is a nonprofit, nonpartisan research institute, um, we, we see the world in terms of problems and solutions. Um, we don't play sort of the partisan yelling game that it, it may shock some of you to realize that that happens around here, that there's <laughs> a, a lot of heat but not a lot of light uh, in politics sometimes. Uh, we want to solve uh, complicated and, and challenging prob problems on a wide range of issues and push for freer markets and limited effective government. Um, right now, the effective part uh, is a particular challenge. Uh, it, it's easy to get lost in the back and forth and, and miss some opportunities. Um, what we realized at our street was we need to learn from people who have been in office, who have had careers of public service, and have been through a lot, have seen a lot. Uh, in, in, in a town that's very much a, what have you done for late, what have you done for me lately town, we need to learn from people who've had a lot of experience and seen a lot of things and may have some ideas. Uh, we, we can act as if we don't know that politics play a role in what politicians can and can't say. When you're standing for elected office, there's some practical realities in terms of the way you speak, you talk about policy, you talk about the issues. Uh, as members decide to end their careers uh, and leave office, it's an opportunity to ask some of the questions that maybe at different points in their career they aren't as able to answer as frankly. And that I think can be really useful information and, and can be instructive going forward. Um, the way that we're gonna do this is get started. I'm gonna just sort of ask questions. We'll have a back and forth. Um, we'll do that for a little while. Then we'll open it up to some questions from the group. And uh, with that, uh, I want to welcome Congressman Jimmy Duncan. Uh, he's on transportation and infrastructure, oversight and government reform. He's been in office since 1988. Um, rather than uh, going through the laundry list of accomplishments and, and votes and things like that over a 30-year career, um, let's just get started. Is that all right with you, Congressman? Sure, anything. <laughs> so I, I actually want to start with my favorite question first. Um, so you've just won a special election in the late 80s. Um, you are going to Congress. If you could tell yourself back in, uh, I think, 1988, one piece of advice going into your congressional career with hindsight um, that you have now, what would you tell yourself then? What piece of advice to have a successful career and represent your constituents well? Well, I don't know if I have anything dramatic to, to say in that regard. I certainly uh, have many memories uh, about uh, my first election. Uh, the Washington Post uh, had an article about three weeks before the election and said the campaign against me was the most negative in the country that year. And I had been a judge for seven and a half years and. Uh, in Tennessee, you have to resign your judgeship, or you're supposed to resign your judgeship. There's no enforcement mechanism, but you, you're supposed to resign your judgeship if you run for a non-judicial uh, office. And so I had resigned, went several months without pay, and things got so uh, negative that uh, I told my mother at one point, I said, Mom, if I had a million dollars tax-free, I could pay to get back in my judgeship and get out of this thing, I would do it. And uh, um, I, uh, my chief of staff, uh, Bob Griffiths, uh, is one of my longtime best friends. Uh, um, he fought in some of the worst fighting uh, in Vietnam on Hamburger Hill. One night we crossed the street during the campaign. He said, uh, he said, I've never been through anything this bad before. I said, well, Bob, you fought some of the worst fighting in Vietnam. And he said, well, it wasn't this bad. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know, it got pretty bad. but. Uh, one thing I am pleased about uh, is that in this en entire 30 years that I've been here, uh, I've been able to get along uh, real well with uh, almost everybody up here, both Democrats and Republicans. And uh, so um, uh, I think I would tell people that uh, uh, while there seems to be more hatred and anger in politics today than there was uh, uh, even back when I first ran, um, that uh, here in the Congress, if you try, you're able to. You're you're pretty much able to get along with 
everybody on both sides. And, and that uh, helps because the one thing I can, having grown up in the political family and having spent all these years here, one thing I can tell you is the pendulum swings. And sometimes it swings for you and sometimes it swings against you. My first six years we were in the minority, and of course, it, and so it helps if you get along pretty well with both people. Nancy Pelosi had a date night uh, many years ago, they, that's what she called it, and wanted you to sit in the State of the Union with uh, members of the other party. And I had two members, Richard Neal of Massachusetts and Jerry Costello of Illinois, who asked me to be their date, and I said, well, I'll sit between both of you. <laughs> so that's that's the one. T that's the only time I sat on the Democratic side in the in the State of the Union. But uh, you know, I've got uh, too many stories and a lot of a lot of memories. Well, obviously, that first campaign didn't deter you. Um, you. You continued with a career of public service. In terms of what you view as the qualifications for the job, and I understand you, the biggest qualification is you have to win at the election. Um, but what are some of the skills that you think would equip a congressman now to be an effective re representative for his or her constituents? Well, in the the House is a lot different than the Senate. You have to you have to have a, I think you have to have a heart for service, and you want to try to help as many people as you can. And and uh, but the uh, second thing is, I think uh, you need to realize that uh, it's not a forty hour a week job. I mean. Uh, I always felt very lucky to have my job, but uh, in, in this job, you get to work nights and weekends and holidays. And uh, uh, in fact, I think, I, I think I've set the, uh, I think I should be in the Guinness Book of World Records on speaking at Eagle Scout ceremonies. And, uh, and uh, I've been to more Eagle Scout ceremonies and 50th wedding anniversaries, and, uh, but uh, that's, uh, it's, uh, it's long, long hours, but uh, mm -hmm. I, ha I have loved it. I've loved every job I ever had at the time I had it. And uh, I'm really gonna, uh, I had one reporter who came to me and said, I bet you're glad to be uh, um, getting out of here, glad to be leaving. I said, no, I'm gonna really miss this. But uh, the other side of it is I've got nine grandchildren <laughs> all at home in Knoxville, which is a real blessing. And I'm 71 years old and I started noticing about four or five years ago that uh, in the obituaries that half the men were dying younger than me and I noticed on the planes every week that I'm either the oldest or next oldest on the plane and I decided that there, it probably was time for me to leave. So in terms of um, seeing these changes through, seeing um, the difficulty and the disconnect, one of the things with the R Street Institute is we have offices in the states, we have a hub here in DC, so when I'm back in home in Nashville or when I, um, when our folks around the states see what's happening there, the, the real disconnect is communication between what's happening in Washington and constituents back home. I mean, that seems to be a real challenge. What's talked, away, talked about in the Beltway, what's discussed here is not the conversation that happens back in districts, and we see a lot of that. What, how would you advise a new crop of incoming members to say, Here's how to effectively communicate with your constituents about what's important to them um, in the sort of chaos of D.C. I mean, how do you decide what to communicate? How do you communicate well with them? Well, there's several things. I've, uh, of course, the first thing I would say uh, to a newcoming member is uh, uh, spend as much time at home as, as possible. Uh, I told my wife when I first came up here that I wanted our kids to be raised in Tennessee, and they visited up a, a lot up here. But I think that was uh, uh, that was good because uh, in in a house uh, uh, in a in the house you need you, you, when you're running every other year, and um, we uh, for many years we've had this um, uh, Duncan family barbecue where we've been lucky enough to have eight to ten thousand people come to it, and it's a but I've had probably two or 300 people over the years tell me that uh, they say, Congressman, I come to your barbecue every year. And I just thank them. I don't tell them I don't do it every year. I do it every other year. But I found out the two years rolls around so fast that to most people it just seems like one year. And so, uh, uh, but um, um, I, would, uh, I would say that um, uh, I, would, I would also recommend to them that they travel. 
during my first uh, uh, six years uh, in Congress, I was like most new members. I was scared to go. I didn't want to be attacked for going on a CODEL and all that sort of stuff. And I went on a, a, a couple of trips uh, just in the United States. And I went on a couple of uh, trips that were not, uh, you know, not paid for by the taxpayers. I went to Israel and so forth. Uh, uh, in fact, there's a picture in the paper today. It's been 25 years since uh, Yitzhak Rabin and uh, Yasser Arafat sang the, uh, signed the peace accords at the White House. And, I, and uh, that was one month after um, I had gone to Israel for the first time. And I, I, I jokingly said after I went to Israel, peace broke out. <laughs> but uh, uh, but uh, I remember going to those the signing. And, uh, but I would tell these young members, one of the... Uh, what I have learned in the many years since then, one of the best ways that you can uh, get to know other members and get along with other members is to go on some of these uh, congressional trips. You, you, uh, uh, you not only do you learn a lot uh, and you follow things a little more closely after you've been to a country, but the biggest benefit is you get, you get to know other members in a better, closer, more personal way than you ever would if you didn't travel. Well, and, and you mentioned peace. Um, one of the I think probably toughest votes that you took, um, and repeatedly so, was dealing with the Iraq War. And you were one of the Republicans who said, I don't want to get involved there, um, and, and were very clear about that stance. Uh, tell, tell me more about that in terms of, there's a moment in your career where you're taking a very tough vote, particularly with many constituents back home, what leads you to make a decision like that? What would your advice be for members who are facing votes where they know that it, they may have a conviction it's the right thing to do, but it's not necessarily the popular thing to do? Well, the night before that vote, one of the television stations in Knoxville had a poll and it said 74% of the people in my district were in favor of the war, 9% were against, and 17% were undecided. So I really did, that was the, the one time when I seriously wondered was I ending my political career, but uh, uh, and for the first three or four years after it, uh, that, it was clearly the most unpopular vote I'd ever cast. But uh, slowly, 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 it became one of the most popular, and that that really was very surprising to me. Uh, I I was here for the first Gulf War, and I heard. Uh, um, General Schwarzkopf and Colin Powell and others say uh, talk about uh, Yitzhak or um, talk about Saddam Hussein and his elite troops and how great a threat they were. And then I saw those same elite troops surrendering to CNN camera crews or empty tanks, and I thought then that the threat had been greatly exaggerated. In addition, I was speaking to a group at the Greenbrier one time, and I saw a headline in one of the papers at the Greenbrier that, uh, and this was between the first two wars, that uh, one of our bombs had gone astray and killed uh, seven little boys, and it told the anguish of a man whose um, uh, little son had had his head blown off. And, uh, and another, I saw another article about we were spending $4 million a day um, a bombing uh, in between the two wars, and so I, Became, I started really reading everything I could get my hands on. I remember uh, Forbes magazine had a story that said, uh, we win, what then? And said a uh, prolonged war in Iraq would cause American soldiers to be sitting ducks for Islamic terrorists. So they knew that I was um, leaning the way I was leaning, so they called me down to the White House and put me in a little secure room with Condoleezza Rice and George Tenet and John McLaughlin, the two heads of the CIA. And I said to him, at the, uh, uh, f f well, first of all, there had just been a story Lawrence Lindsay, the Harvard professor who was the president's economics advisor, had uh, said uh, that a war with Iraq would cost us $200 billion or more. And I asked about that, and Condoleezza Rice said, oh, no, it wouldn't cost $200 billion. It would cost 50 or $60 billion, and we'd get some of that back from our allies, which had to be the worst estimate in the history of the world. <laughs> and so then I said to him, I said, well, if, if you're if you're going to go against every traditional conservative position of being against massive foreign aid and huge deficit spending and uh, 
conservatives being the biggest critics of the UN and you're going to war to enforce UN resolutions, if you go against all those traditional conservative positions, do you have any evidence of any imminent threat? And they didn't. And uh, George Tenet confirmed that in his first speech at Georgetown University the day after he resigned. So I voted against the war and it was rough for the first few years. I had this uh, uh, Baptist church I was supposed to speak at one Sunday and the minister called up uh, the money before and told me his biggest uh, contributor, his main deacon, would pull out of, of the church if I came, things like that. But it, it all worked out in the end. So I, I would tell a, a, a new member, I'd say, you know, if you're going to get some tough votes, but don't worry about it, all the pressure that you come under on, on one vote, because I can tell you there's always going to be another vote where they're going to want, there's going to be some other vote a, a few weeks or a few months later where they're going to need your vote. So do what you think is right. Well, speaking of leadership and leadership pressure, uh, one of the fascinating things that I noticed is you've served under Jim Wright, Tom Foley, Newt Gingrich, Dennis Hastert, Nancy Pelosi, John Boehner, and Paul Ryan. You've had a broad array of speakers, Democrat and Republican, that you've had to work with, that you've had to address legislative priorities, their leadership styles, things like that. What did you take away? What were some of the, the leadership decisions and qualities that you admired, regardless of Republican or Democrat, that you found effective and that as Congress goes forward and has another speaker, um, what are some of the things that you would advise them trying to lead this body that seems, in many respects, a lot more fractured, um, at least publicly, than it's been in the past? I remember uh, in my first few months, uh, I'd, I'd been here only just a few, uh, five or six months or something, and uh, Jim Wright resigned. Uh, and it was the re at first, uh, I think it was the first resignation of a sitting speaker in, in history. And, and at that same time, we had the, the House bank scandal, which most of you will not remember, but that was huge at that time. And the Berlin Wall came down. I mean, there was all kinds of things happening and during those first few months. In fact, and, and a group of, I was standing down in the well of the House between votes at right about that time, and Congressman Joel Heffley and from Colorado said to the four or five of us standing around, said, have you ever stopped to think that uh, ever since Duncan got here, this whole place has just fallen apart? <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, um, I came in in the smallest freshman class in history uh, uh, since the number went to 435 in 1910, so they didn't pay much attention to, uh, to, uh, um, to us at that uh, time. I, I have sp uh, served under a lot of speakers. Um, speaker Hastert was a nice man, but he was not really the speaker. Tom DeLay was the speaker. I mean, uh, actually, that's, uh, it, it, that's really the way it was. Tom, Tom DeLay put uh, Denny Hastert in. Uh, and, I, and I ran into problems uh, with that because um, I had voted consistently with, the, um, uh, with all the other Republicans those first six years when we were in the minority. But then I didn't uh, like some of the bills that we had come out with. And... Uh, um, after we took over, and I remember Tom DeLay one night, uh, he said, uh, he said, Jimmy, these are Republican bills now. I said, yes, Tom, but you're spending more than the Democrats are spending. We were still being attacked for not spending enough, but uh, we'd really disappointed our base by keeping on increasing the uh, spending and the debts and so forth, and that's what really led to the creation of the Tea Party later on. Uh, Newt Gingrich, uh, um, uh, I had I had him down to uh, speak at our Lincoln Day dinner in the, in uh, February of 1994, and uh, we drew the biggest crowd we'd ever had to um, uh, to a Lincoln Day dinner, and you could uh, you could start to see that that's uh, you could see what later happened in the election with that and and. Uh, also, I remember the um, that spring we they in a special election. We elected Ron Lewis from Kentucky. He came in in a special election, and Congressman Hal Rogers, who's my best friend, uh, he was he was introducing uh, Ron at, when he was sworn in, 
and he gave him this glowing introduction, but he got down to the end of the introduction and he forgot Ron Lewis's name. And so he said, I want to, I want to now introduce our newest member, my good friend, Congressman Ron Taylor. And then Ron Lewis was called on three weeks later to introduce Hal at a Kentucky Republican convention. And he, he said, he gave him a glowing introduction, got down to the end. And he said, so now I want to introduce our great leader, Congressman Roy Rogers. <laughs> so he paid the, paid Hal back. But, uh, uh, Newt Gingrich was, was kind to me, and he offered me, uh, at the end of that six years, he offered me a seat on the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, the, we had 10 openings. In fact, put three freshmen on that year. And I'm probably about the only person in the country that ever turned down a, um, a chance to go on the Ways and Means Committee. But uh, I was going to get to start chairing the Aviation Subcommittee. And my dad, who was in Congress before me, had been here 23 and a half years and had never gotten to chair anything. And I was going to get to chair a subcommittee that uh, I really liked, so I um, turned it down. But uh, I didn't. I didn't like, and still don't like, the system that um, uh, Newt Gingrich set up, and which both parties have followed. And I think the, I'm amazed that the media has not uh, criticized this. That they base um, uh, uh, chairmanships and other things on uh, how much money you raise for the party and uh, you have to give the leadership your voting card, neither one of which I've been willing to do. And I think that's, a, I think that's really unfortunate that uh, your knowledge uh, of a committee or your, uh, your um, hard work on a committee uh, doesn't mean much at all. What means most is how much money you raise and, and whether you're willing to give um, your voting card to the leadership. In fact, um, Mark Sanford sat down by me one night after he came back the second time, and he asked me how I thought he should vote on this particular bill. I said, "Well, if you want to be a chairman, I guess you'll have to vote for the uh, uh, vote for the bill." And uh, he said, "Well, he said I've earned enough merit badges. I've always remembered him saying that, but I also remember that one of the votes uh, I heard." Uh, um, uh, Another member standing behind me and say, "Well, I wouldn't vote for this bill except except I'm a chairman and I've got to vote for it." Well, so. it, talk about that a little bit more because one of the questions that we wanted to ask was, "What are processes and procedures in the House of Representatives that you'd like to see changed?" Obviously, you just mentioned the way chairmanships are awarded um, is is a challenge. What are some other rules and aspects of the way business is conducted in the House. Um, a lot of times we don't talk about that. that that's not, doesn't make sexy headlines. It's not going to be on cable news talking about House procedure um, or, or policies that leadership implements. What are some of those things that you think need to change in order for the House of Representatives to work better? The, the, uh, the biggest change is what I just uh, talked about. Uh, there's other things that, uh, you know, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, I'm one of the few people that I've, I've, never, uh, I've never really bashed the Congress. I've loved being here. I've, I've considered a real privilege to have served. And so I, uh, uh, I don't have a, a lot of uh, criticism to offer. I would say that... Uh, um, um, you know, if, if, if I had some, uh, some suggestions, I would say, you know, I'd say we do too many bills. We do, uh, uh, if, you know, there's, there's just too many bills that uh, members vote on or have to vote on that they know almost nothing about just because we're ramming so many lo uh, things through. And, so, and some of these bills, uh, the, of course, uh, uh, most bills pass with huge, huge majorities on both sides. I mean, uh, um, but um, I don't know. We, uh, uh, my, main, uh, my main problem, of course, since I've been here is, is um, uh, or my main objection is, it's just far too e easy to spend other people's money. And, uh, and because of that, uh, and everybody, you know, when you, get, when you get into politics, you probably have more desire than the average person. You want people to like you. So you, you don't get into office or almost none of us get into office wanting to make people mad. And so uh, we just have said, we just say yes to too many people, and now we've run this debt, debt up. Uh, and I, uh, 
uh, you know, it was about, it was, I think, slightly less than $3 trillion when I first came here. Now it's $21 trillion, and I think that's a horrible thing for our future. Well, in terms of spending, uh, I, I want to focus on that a little bit. You've mentioned that several times. Uh, when the, the last administration was here, Republicans were haranguing deficits, talking about the national debt, th very much the party of fiscal conservatism, of fiscal restraint. Um, the administration changes. Um, now, latest CBO numbers, we're looking at a deficit moving towards a trillion dollars again. Is, is fiscal conservatism is, and I don't even use the word conservatism because it, it kind of implies one side of the equation. Is fiscal restraint dead? Is it a talking point? Is it a nice dream about fiscal responsibility? Or is, is this something that's a runaway train that we can't get back under control because of the nature of essentially politicians wanting people to like them? And, you know, we're, we're so far in, in the hole now, I don't know. It's a, um, I, I will say that er, everybody had voted the way I have voted since I've been here. I don't think we would have hardly any debt and, uh, because I haven't voted for uh, very many appropriations bills, and I, and I certainly have been strongly speaking out against all the trillions that we've spent uh, on unnecessary wars in the Middle East because it's not just the... Uh, that's... that's uh, that actually has been a little bit of, su of a surprise to me that I, t that, uh, I turned into an anti-war Republican. But I think it's more, I think it's more, of, uh, uh, I think I'm more really, a, 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 a more really an Eisenhower Republican because uh, uh, he certainly was uh, believed in, in fiscal restraint. And uh, so, uh, but I, I've said many times, Admiral Mike Mullen, who was chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, for four years from 2007 to 2011, he, uh, he gave many speeches in saying that the greatest threat to our national security is our national debt, and not enough people are concerned enough about that, I don't think. Is, is there anything in terms of concrete steps? I, obviously, there's the concrete step of don't spend what you don't have. Um, are, are there things that Congress can do in terms of different legislative vehicles, different mechanisms for reining in spending um, that, that you think makes sense? Because I think there's a lot of knowledge that, hey, man, that, that debt looks really ugly. The interest on the debt is crowding out other priorities. Is, is there anything that can be done short of, hey, we need to th trim out these appropriation bills or we need to raise taxes to generate more revenue to match our spending? I understand the basic economics, but are there any other controls that, you know, can be put in place to, to stop this? Because it doesn't seem to be changing. I, you know, I'm, I'm a little, uh, I'm optimistic about the future because uh, the whole history of the world, things, things have, have consistently gotten better in spite of all the problems. I mean, sure. poor people today live better than kings did two or three hundred years ago. But... Uh, but I am pessimistic about uh, that. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I said, for instance, uh, at the time of, of our uh, tax cut, I said, I believe, I believe uh, in, the, in the tax cuts, but I said, I also f uh, believed and voted that we should, should have cut spending at the same time. And uh, I think there's, uh, you know, there weren't enough people on our side willing to do both. So in terms of, um, I wanted to ask a, a little bit more abstract questions for a minute. One of the things that you'll hear from virtually every political consultant is that you may not want to go negative, but it works. Um, we see a lot of fear in politics. We see a lot of, hey, you need to be afraid that the others, if the other side wins, your whole reality will change and you will lose. Uh, you pointed out that the world trajectory has actually moved, generally speaking, in a pretty positive direction. Mm -hmm. We've made it a, as a country. Things have gone in a pretty positive direction. Um, how do you address that? How, how do we combat this, let's scare voters to death to get them to surrender their minds and their independent thought about what's going on with their elected officials? It does seem that, uh, you know, mo most people that uh, look at it say that, uh, you know, everybody says they're against negative uh, 
advertising, but that, it, that that's the only kind of uh, advertising that really moves voters, that it brings both, both sides down. And I'm not, uh, I'm not an advertising uh, person. I do, I do know this, uh, in, and we had a, a gubernatorial primary in Tennessee this year, and um, the two people that they thought were, that almost everybody thought were the leading candidates, um, went heavily negative against each other and a third man who didn't go negative came up and uh, who'd started out with 4% of the vote and he won the primary, much to uh, everybody's amazement. So I don't know. It's a, um, uh, if you get in that situation where you have two, uh, you don't always have that though, where you have two people in a, in a primary going negative against each other, Na you know, when you get in the general, it's a little different. Uh, uh, situation. So uh, I want to ask a little bit, uh, you mentioned Hal Rogers, you mentioned friendship. Um, people don't often associate Congress with friendship. Um, you know, there's some great books that talk about the relationships in Congress, um, uh, Masters of the Senate, for example. Um, what What is it like to have a friendship in Congress? How would you advise members to build those relationships so that, you know, they have a sounding board when they're here, um, as opposed to home where many of them have constituents and family. Uh, talk a little bit about that relationship specifically, if you don't mind, and then more broadly, how can members do those things um, so that they have a more relational experience in engaging Congress? Well, I will tell you that I think one of the best things uh, uh, about my service here is that I've been able to make really close friends from all over the whole country and and uh, and and from uh, both parties. I mean, um, um, Mark Gordon was a Democratic member from uh, Tennessee for a number of years and been a lobbyist for the last several years. When I announced I was going to not run again, he called me up and he he said. He said, "Oh, Jimmy, tell me it's not so, you know, and all that." And and uh, I mentioned uh, Jerry Costello and Richard Neal and and uh, uh, Jim Walsh, uh, Republican, was uh, was and still is a very close friend of mine. Uh, many many friendships. Hal Rogers, a uh, lot of others. Uh, some former Congressman Sonny Callahan is coming up. We're going to, to have dinner tonight. So. There's just there's just so many uh, people that I can mention. Uh, uh, um, Congressman Jim Oberstar was the chairman of the Transportation Committee, and he came down and spent a whole day with me at the. Uh, although we, we had uh, we were dedicating a new transit center, a fifty million dollar transit center in Knoxville, that they were kind enough to name after me, but. Uh, uh, Jim Overstar came down and went about to a whole group of transportation things. It was the middle of August, and it was an election year. And when we took him back to the Knoxville airport and, and uh, about 6, six o'clock that night, he told me and my chief of staff he'd only been able to be home two nights that uh, whole summer. And uh, we... Uh, we remarked to each other when we walked away, my uh, staff member and I, we said, boy, he must have an easy election. And, but that's the year that he lost. So, so uh, he was uh, certainly a good man and kind to me, but apparently he didn't go home enough there at the end. Um, it's, it's really unfortunate that because of the TV shows, a lot of people out in the country think we all hate each other up here, and, this, and that's, not, that's not true. Although I was... I, you know, I was really surprised when so many Democratic members refused to go to the uh, uh, president's inauguration because I didn't, I didn't vote for um, uh, Clinton or Obama, either one, but it never crossed my mind not to go to their inaugurations. And, the, and both of them were always real nice to me, and, um, and I've tr I tried to be nice to them. I remember, I remember one uh, year... Um, uh, I had two firefighters from Knoxville up, and um, I told them, I said, if you'll meet me here at the subway, and uh, I said, I'll, I'll be, I'm will be, supposed to have lunch in the Rayburn room with the uh, president and the prime minister of Ireland. I said, we'll stand there at the door, and I might be able to introduce you to uh, uh, President Clinton. 
And one of these two firefighters, Bill Warwick, he had been the Knox County Democratic chairman. Maybe he was still at that point. And uh, Bill Clinton uh, came down through there and, uh, uh, and uh, I introduced him. And then uh, the president, he put his arm around my shoulders. He said, you all take care of this guy down there now. And Bill Warwick, he said, oh, we do, Mr. President. We think Congressman Duncan is the greatest. And he was so excited. I don't think to this, I don't think he knew what he was saying. I wished I'd had, <laughs> I wished I'd had a recording of that. But uh, anyway. Uh, speak a little bit to, uh, again, another thing that we heard a lot about um, in the Obama administration was executive overreach. Um, we, we saw a situation where the president had some priorities that, frankly, wouldn't have passed through Congress, and so chose to try to use the extent of his executive power to kind of push through some things. Um, we've seen the Trump administration, frankly, do some of those same things, and the uh, w w with similar overreach in the, in the sense of saying, hey, the executive wants to do a thing. Congress has deferred a lot to the executive branch. For, forget party, but said, executive branch, we're going to stock the power there, the presidential election is going to be for all the marbles. How can Congress reclaim its role as a co-equal branch of government, or in the first branch, uh, the, the branch that is charged with the legislative power? Um, can that happen, or is this a situation where members in Congress totally defer to the executive branch, and the executive branch essentially quasi-legislates and enforces? Well, that's a very difficult uh, question. We, we live in a celebrity age, and the greatest celebrity in this country is the president, whoever that is, by either party. And so that person is going to have a lot of uh, power regardless of, uh, of what we do. Uh, but I agree with you, there, has, there, is, uh, there really is far too much power in the uh, uh, e executive branch uh, today. Um, but um, we, uh, uh, I don't know, we, uh, we've talked about that uh, uh, for years. And, um, and, you know, and some people say, well, there's too much power in the bureaucracy, and there is. On the other hand, because there's um, uh, because there is so much power in the bureaucracy, and it's and because it's primarily because it's become so big, that uh, what I found through the years was that um, um, because it's so unusual for a, um, a uh, mo most bureaucrats are not contacted very often by members of Congress. So if a member of Congress calls up uh, somebody in the bureaucracy, they usually can get a pretty good, pretty good response. So there's some there's some quiet power there that uh, has been um, has really helped me in my job. So there's still there's there's power in the Congress that maybe people don't realize is there. And 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 for instance, if if I have a if I have somebody uh, uh, that wants a meeting, you know, I can, I can get a meeting with about anybody in the bureaucracy, and then if, I, if I'm going to be involved in the meeting, I mean, uh, uh, some of these uh, uh, bureaucrats, uh, I think they, want, they like excuses to get out of their offices and come to Capitol Hill, so, <laughs> so they'll, they'll send uh, usually four or five people up. And so, Before we ask, uh, sort of open it up for questions, I want to ask a question about the, uh, the, the other legislative house, uh, the Senate. I hear from members in the House, um, well, look, we do our job, we churn out legislation all the time, and it goes to die in the Senate. Um, I, I think the Constitution contemplated at least some of that in terms of the Senate being the body that's slower to act, that, that, that is being contemplative about some of this stuff. Talk about that relationship a little bit, your, either your relationship with members over in the Senate or the relationship between the House and the, and the Senate in terms of moving policy priorities forward. Um, can that be more effective? Is it working as intended? Uh, what do you see there? Well, I'm not sure that anything is working exactly as it was intended. Uh, uh, <laughs> the, the, found, the Founding Fathers, I think, would be shocked uh, at, the, at the whole 
situation that we're confronted with today, the, the, for instance, the cost of campaigns, I think, for instance, they would have uh, uh, given us uh, uh, four-year terms in the House if they'd known that these campaigns were going to cost nearly as much as they do. Uh, uh, sure, I hear that, uh, a lot of that uh, frustration with the Senate, and I've been here, uh, I've been here so long now, I've served with, with about half the Senate, um, counting the Democrats. But you know, the interesting thing is the, a lot of the senators have that same frustration, not so much against the House, it's just the, the, at the pace or the workings of the Senate. In fact, most of the members, most of the former members of the House um, uh, who are over in the Senate tell us that they, they enjoyed their time in the House more than they're enjoying it over there in the Senate. Of course, whenever I have a House member running for the Senate, I've told many of them over the years, I've said, I'm going to feel really sorry for you when you get elected to the Senate, and they say, why? And I say, well, you only get to run for office once every six years instead of every other year like you do in the House. And they say, I said, think how many boring election nights you're going to have. And they'll say, oh, yeah, that's going to be terrible. So, <laughs> But um, it's, uh, you know, it's just kind of the... Kind of the way it is, I guess.